Well, good morning. Welcome to worship at First Baptist Church today. Whether you're with us on Zoom or here in person, it's a good day to be together, isn't it? It's just a privilege to come together today on this Pentecost Sunday with the Church Universal. We have heavy hearts over many things, even this past week here in our local community. Um, we also have glad hearts because we're a part of the body of Christ. And so I invite you now on this Pentecost Sunday, um, as we remember Christ's promise of the Holy Spirit coming to us, the church, abiding with us, giving us strength, and empowering us to live a life of faith. Let's join now in some silent prayer time, asking God the Spirit to speak to our hearts, um, to enlighten our minds and to guide our walk. And as a simple act of openness, I invite you, if you wish, to pray today with your hands open, palms up on your laps, symbolic of receiving the presence of God today. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, come to us today in fresh new ways. Give us a nudging of your presence. Amen. Okay. Let's join together now in our call to worship, which will be coming from the book of the Gospel of John and the book of Acts. Um, today we'll begin and end reading in unison. And continuing, I'll read the light print and you the dark. But let's begin together. I will ask the Father, and he will give you a helper, that he might be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth. The, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said. And you, and you shall, shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the uttermost, remotest part of the earth. A new, a new commandment, commandment I will give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And when the day of Pentecost came, suddenly there came a noise like a violent rushing wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. tongues. Let's join our hearts and, and our voices together and sing Spirit of God now. Um, number 2117 in your black hymnal. Um, stand if you're able, please. <laughs>
As you stand, let's greet each other this morning. Say hello, your neighbor. And Beth will come and have our Old Testament reading and our prayer this morning. Our uh, Old Testament reading this morning comes from both Amos and Micah, and you'll find that on pages 854 and 866 in your pew Bible. And we'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Hate evil and love what is good. Turn your courts into true halls of justice. Perhaps even yet, the Lord God of heaven's armies will have mercy on the remnant of his people. I hate all your show and pretense, the hypocrisy of your religious festivals and solemn assemblies. I will not accept your burnt offerings and grain offerings. I won't even notice all your choice peace offerings. Away with your noisy hymns of praise, I will not listen to the music of your harps. Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice and an endless river of righteous living. And these wonderful words from Micah. What can we bring to the Lord? What kind of offering should we give him? Should we bow before God with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good and this is what he requires of you to do what is right to love mercy and to walk humbly with your god may the lord add his blessing to the reading of this scripture let us pray Lord God, as we worship together this morning, we thank you for the gift of your spirit, which guides and comforts and surrounds us with love. May we have the courage to act with justice and the compassion to love and to forgive as Jesus taught. May we generously serve one another and walk humbly with you. Open our hearts, Lord, to the understanding of your word and today's message. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's stand again together if you're able and sing We Are Called, number 2172 in your Black Hymnals.
Tuesday morning, May 24th, an 18-year-old gunman entered a Uvalde, Texas elementary school and executed 19 young children and two teachers. How long, O oh Lord, how long? Cried the prophet Habakkuk, and so cry I, and so cry many of us. How long, O oh Lord? But maybe God is asking us, how long, O oh people, how long? Here in Iowa, our eight-year-old grandson's first communion fell two mornings earlier on Sunday, May 22nd. Perhaps the 19 murdered children will never have the opportunity to take communion, or if they have had, never again. In Colorado, our elementary school teacher's daughter, teacher's daughter's reaction to the Uvalde, Texas shooting was, Dad, I felt like I was going to vomit. I hugged every one of my kids. The next day, a parent came to our classroom and gave me a hug for loving and teaching their children in these terrifying days. I couldn't hold it back. I cried in the embrace. A teacher friend in the Carolinas posted on Facebook, my students arrive early for class so they can try to get a seat close to the door, hoping to improve their chance for survival. Two years ago in a workshop on how to disarm an active shooter, I used a coworker's necktie to learn how to tourniquet a bullet wound. I no longer wonder when it will stop. I wonder when it will happen here. This evil, this insanity affects all of us, doesn't it? Will it never end? As I sat writing this sermon, Memorial Day, the news reported 11 more mass shootings in America that day. 11. By now, as you know, the number is higher, including three dead right here in Ames, and another 14 shot last night in Philadelphia, three dead, 11 wounded. The prophet Habakkuk cried out, How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and thou wilt not hear? I cry out to thee, Violence, yet thou dost not save. Why dost thou make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Destruction and violence are ever before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. What does the Lord require of us? I don't think it's our religiosity, do you? Is that what God wants? I don't think so. Some varieties of Christianity today piously lift up their Jesus, but he's not Jesus. Any lying, violent, murdering, soul-selling, and buying Jesus is not Jesus. I remember the placard that bobbed up and down in the crowd in, on the campus of UCLA back in the 60s in the Vietnam era. The placard said, Jesus, yes. Christianity, no. Can it be any worse today? Romano Gardini grieves, the church is the cross on which Christ is crucified. Thank you, Jerry and Beth, for the beautiful reading of your scripture and to reinforce their superb reading. Hear the words of Amos again. I hate, I reject your festivals. Could say dinners on the ground, fellowships, I don't delight in your solemn assemblies, your worship services. Even though you suffer up to me burnt offerings and grain offerings, your tithes and your offerings, I won't accept them. I don't want them. I will not even look upon your peace offerings or your fatlings or your special offerings. Take away from me the noise of your piano and your guitar. I'm not going to listen to your music. I will not listen to your songs or to your harps, but... Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And the words from prof the prophet Micah, 
Yes, they're beautiful, Jerry and Beth, aren't they? What does the Lord require of them? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Science, there are so many virtues, aren't there? But love and justice are our two moral absolutes in the eyes of God. If we fail in these two areas, no amount of church going, no claim of Christian nation status, nor lip service will please God, will it? How do we meet God's requirements for us and live pleasing to God? We might suggest these ways. First, let us walk humbly with our God. Pride is the mother of all sin. Pride made looser for the devil. We come to God only through humility. We need God. We don't know everything. We're neither omniscient, omnipotent, infallible. Only God is. Good theology helps us become good humans. But you know, we should do our theology like we do our crossword puzzles with pencil. Because sometimes we think we have all the answers and we find out we don't. If pride is the mother of all sin, humility is the mother of all virtues. Let us walk humbly with our God. Second, let us commit to an ethic of caring. One characterized by love and justice for all, recognizing the sanctity of life. For all life comes from God and each of us is created in the image of God. Third, as followers of Christ, let us allow ourselves to be taught by the Holy Spirit of the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and who called us to love God with all of our heart, souls, and mind, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. This coming of the Holy Spirit to indwell believers, to teach us and empower us, is the beauty and the dynamite of Pentecost, isn't it? Called by some the birthday of the church. So how might the Holy Spirit teach us to think about the sanctity of life? First, we might be reminded of the issues on the agenda of America and the world. These include abortion, climate change, fossil fuels and pollution of air and water, Racism, nuclear arms, war, hunger, poverty, pornography, gay, lesbian, transgender, or LGBTQI issues, health care, medical research and practice, such as stem cell research and cloning of animals and humans, animal rights, COVID and associated ethical issues, immigration and death at the U.S.-Mexico border, Disrespect for others and mistreatment, lack of kindness and compassion, dishonesty of politicians, government and media, authoritarianism, moral relativism, lying, religious liberty, police, drugs, self, sex trafficking, slavery, crime, violence, prison reform, sentencing reform, capital punishment, terrorism, foreign and domestic, torture, euthanasia, suicide, mass shootings, guns. These are 33 moral issues confronting us today. You could probably add to the list. Clearly, time does not permit us to discuss these 33 moral issues facing us. Besides, there's, there's no part of our anatomy equipped to withstand the length of time required by such a discourse. But Iowa State University could host a national or international symposium or conference keynoted by a spectrum of acclaimed intellectuals within any one or all of these areas. And you know what? No unanimity of viewpoint among attendees would likely occur, would it? Would we fare any better here today? And do we have the time to consider all 33 issues cited? Of course not. The complexity of the issues, the sheer number, and our varying convictions about them dictate that we settle for the following question for now. 
posed by the Gallup organization in a poll, the Gallup poll. In your view, what is the most important problem with the state of moral values in the country today? The highest percentage of respondents, 18% of the respondents, the highest percentage named consideration of others, compassion, caring, tolerance, and respect. That's the single greatest problem. You know what? We don't have to agree on a single thing in order to be kind to each other, do we? The next highest response in the poll to the question, 10% cited this one, lack of faith and true religion. Well, over a decade ago, you might have seen this, but the Colson Center published a list of the top 10 moral issues facing America. Number one was sanctity of life. Since all 33 issues we cited pertain to sanctity of life, and since we believers should view these issues through the lens of faith, and since kind some consideration of others and their viewpoints is needed in society, may we then, in the context of our faith in Jesus Christ and with kindness to each other, right now and later, think for a few moments about sanctity of life on this Pentecost Sunday, the day the, day the Church Universal commemorates the filling of believers with the Holy Spirit, our teacher, the Spirit of Christ. So, let us ask, what is sanctity of life? Well, the word sanctity comes from the Latin sanctus, meaning sacred or holy. Sanctity of life refers to the holiness of human life, created in the image of God, meaning both God and God's creation are holy and should be treated with reverence, dignity, and respect. Anyone wanting to take the life of another human being or ignore the welfare of humans bears the burden of proof to show why such action is moral or immoral. Let us remember Micah 6, 8. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice. To love kindness, to walk humbly with your God. And let us remember Jesus' words. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Let us note, all morality turns on love. Notes the ethicist Lewis Smeets. Love helps others. Justice is being fair. Justice is what love looks like when it goes out in society. Morality is treating people fairly and lovingly. Morality is defending the defenseless. Why should we be concerned about morality and the sanctity of life? Because God is concerned about it and he calls us to be concerned too. So how might we live our concern about the sanctity of life? As the prophet Micah advised, with humility. Let us, let us speak less of our rights and more of our responsibilities. Let us confess our biases. Let us read, pray, reason. Listen to the experiences of others and learn from Scripture. Let us make a commitment to that ethic of caring, characterized by doing justice, being fair, by loving others, helping others. And then let's pray. Let's pray that the indwelling Holy Spirit will give us Jesus' eyes and Jesus' hearts and Jesus' ways 
to love God and others above ourselves. Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, in our culture of death, we need, we need the gospel of life, the gospel of love, the gospel of Jesus Christ, where God's rule on earth comes to pass. As Jesus taught us to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lastly, let us use our voice and vote. We might contact our elected representatives to encourage legislation while we pray. This week I wrote our Iowa senators, Grassley and Ernst, and also Senator Mitch McConnell to express my views on the immediate issue of mass murdering facing us. You can do that too. Simply Google, how do I contact my senator? If you want to call, you can. You don't have to worry about being out debated by a senator. You're not gonna to talk to a senator anyway. They have tens of interns and administrative assistants and they'll take down your, the essence of your message. Or you can email them or you can text message them. Go to the website. How do I Google my senator? And you can express your view, whatever it is, you can do that. Jesus gave his life for us. We can give our voice and vote for others. So, how long, oh Lord, how long? The answer to the cry of our fellow bereaved citizens in Texas, our distressed school teachers in Colorado, the Carolinas here in Iowa, and all across the land to all Americans. How long, oh Lord, how long? The answer may depend less on the Lord and more. On us. Can all the people say? The invitation from the Lord now is to come to his table. In the age of COVID, we take our seat at his table on the pews, but the invitation is to come. The apostle Paul exclaims in scripture, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received in which you stand, by which you're also saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain alive now, but some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also. The Apostle Paul writes that we dare not come to the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. 
Rather, he advises that we examine ourselves and see if there is reason that we should halt, repent, and then proceed. As our pastor, Brother Dave, often says, we come this morning not because we must, but because we may. Not based on our own righteousness, but on his. Not because of anything we have done or do right now, but because what Christ has done for us on the cross. So let's close our eyes just a moment. And understand the words of Jesus when he says the time is now. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Heavenly Father, we hear the words of Jesus and we bow the knee of our soul before the cross and the blood shed for us on Calvary. Wash away all of our sins. We not only confess that we're sinful, individually and corporately, systemically, but we want to repent, turn around and go in a different direction. We pray for ourselves that in our own thinking, we might be conformed to your image. We might be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And by using our voice and our vote and our loving spirits, that we might be used by your Holy Spirit to help transform our world. May we all confess our need for you. And the less we read it and realize it, the more we need you. May we repent. May we come back to the gospel or come to the gospel for the first time, where we love you with all of our hearts, souls, and minds, and we love our neighbors, ourselves. So we come to the table now, not feeling that we're worthy, whatever the admonition of the apostle be, we would never come if we waited till we were worthy. For there's none righteous, no, not one, just as scripture says. So we come not in our worth, but in yours. And we ask you to forgive us of our sins. And may your Holy Spirit indwell us this Pentecost Sunday and live in us and through us, that our lives might be pleasing to you and that we might help our world become pleasing as well. For we make our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. So the great apostle writes, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way, the Apostle Paul writes, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so he writes,
For the love of Christ controls us, having concluded that he died for all of us. And he died for all that they who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, the great apostle writes, if any man or woman is in Christ, he, she, is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Namely, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, but he has committed to us also the work and word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were entreating through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Let us continue our worship with the beautiful offering of our choir.
beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. God's Spirit. We come to you now with prayers of petition, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of joy. We ask your special blessings on Catherine's niece as she travels home, a long journey. Give her safe travels and, and an opportunity to really reflect on the wonderful experience that she has had. We, pay, we pray for Peter and the loss of his sister, Sheila. Be with that family, wrap your arms around them. Let them know of your presence, Holy Spirit. Gird them and guide them. We thank you for safe travels and good progress for Jocelyn. We're grateful for her presence among us. And we ask you to be with us in her next steps, to be with her in her next steps. We pray, O oh Lord, for the those so directly impacted by the events of this week in Ames, tragic death and loss, fear and confusion. We pray that you will show us how to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly. We give thanks for little Fern and her birthday and celebrate the life the beautiful life that is hers. We thank you so much, God, for Emma, for her ministry among us, for her transitions and new beginnings, and especially for her safe return this week. We ask you to be with her in her next steps to let her know of your presence. We celebrate with Adi for his new job. We ask your blessings, your presence, your strength, your power with this family that has meant so much to all of us. We ask you just to guide them and lead them and to let them know that you are with them in these days of transition. And oh God, we do. We join our hearts corporately for all of the heavy issues, the choices that must be made, the directions that must be chosen. We pray for wisdom. We pray that Holy Spirit, you intercede for us as promised, even when we don't know how to pray. And we ask you to show us your ways. As we lift our prayers of petition, thanksgiving, O oh Lord, we just ask that you teach us your ways. Give us the peace of your presence and help us remember each day that you care not for our words, but for our actions. Help us to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. We pray together now as you taught us to pray. Our Father, Father which art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy kingdom, kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will, will be, be done, done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Indy. Might we encircle the sanctuary and, uh, and sing our benediction? Let's do that, congregation. shown you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Go in peace.